Hi guys, Mr. Poli here for Western Civ, this time looking at Chapter 4, Ancient Greece and the rise of Ancient Greece. This is a really long PowerPoint I've developed really over my 10 years here at Fieldcrest, so I'm going to pare this down and break it down into two different videos, so this is the first of those two. So let's get started with some of the things that we learned from the Ancient Greeks over here uh, on the peninsula where they live, very mountainous, very rugged. Uh, and you can see here uh, a lot of the new ideas that we get from the Greeks that we consider part of our Western culture. Okay, let's look at ancient Greece in a chronological sort of outline here, big picture again, as we usually talk about. This is uh, the time frames from the civilizations right before the Greeks uh, up until through a lot of uh, the Greek Empire. Uh, this is from 2000 to 1000 BCE, or BC, before Common Era. We're talking about the, the time period of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, which we've talked about a little bit uh, and saw in the video in class. Uh, from 1000 to about 800 BCE, this is the Dark Ages. It's the time period of Homer. We'll see it's a time period of Dark Ages in a civilization when uh, a lot of our aspects of, of a civilization, including writing, get lost. Uh, 800 to 500 BCE, this 300 time year period, uh, the Lyric Age. Colonization takes place as societies rebound and populations grow. We see the rise of lyric poetry uh, to try to pass on uh, knowledge from the past and the rise of Sparta and Athens as two very distinct and different types of governments and two very different city-states. And then 500 to 330, this is the Classic Age. It's the time period of the Persian Wars where the Greeks join together to fight against the Persians, uh, the Delian League, which starts off as an anti-Persian League and then later becomes sort of a we want to rule everybody league for Athens, uh, the Peloponnesian War because of that change in the Delian League, and then the rise of Macedonia, which leads to um, Alexander the Great and things after the Greek Empire. So here again, uh, a little bit of our geography here. You can see where Mount Olympus is here. This is a uh, very rugged, rocky, mountainous area. A few coastal plains, including Marathon in here. Uh, this is the Peloponnesian Peninsula here, actually connected by this narrow strip of land. Uh, the Aegean Sea with literally thousands of islands here. Uh, as I talked about with the Puerto Rico, it's often easier to kind of go sail around than go uh, straight across over land. Uh, this is Crete, where the uh, Mycenaeans and Minoans are, and what we call Asia Minor over here. This is what they're going to refer to as Ionia. We'll see more about that again in just a moment. Okay, back to our chronological order here. The first empire is a little more detail. Uh, the Minoans, uh, again, lived on Crete, disappeared about 1400 BCE. Uh, possibly might have been the Mycenaeans who drove them out. And we saw the video in class that that great tsunami that probably uh, led to the destruction of uh, the Mycenaeans. Uh, they disappear around 200 BCE. And as I said, traditionally books, including ours, say, was it the Sea People or the Dorians or who was this? And now we know uh, from our geologist friend uh, what actually happened. Okay, both of these, what's important to know is both of these had been flourishing civilizations. And as a civilization, they had literature, trade, art, music, science, all the things that make up a civilization. Okay, so again, they were down here on Crete, kind of put them into context, context and a location. We're going to be looking now at what happens in Greece after those folks go away. Okay. The Mycenaeans, uh, it's believed they arrived from Central Europe in this case, which would be we refer to as Asia Minor. Uh, they built cities with a hilltop fortress. Uh, this is an example of one of those. They adopt uh, the Minoan culture, yet they also take it over. Okay, That idea of building on a hilltop, hey, that's for defensive purposes. Make the enemy have to charge uphill. Okay, Imagine football players, if you're out there, think on a hot day, all your equipment, and i got to do some running sprints and guys are throwing spears at me, and not only that, I have to charge up hill to do that. Not a fun prospect. Okay. Moving along here, uh, it's about uh, 1100 to 750 BC, the Dorians invade. Uh, there's some things going on here that we know about. Uh, these guys did have iron weapons as opposed to the bronze weapons that the earlier civilizations had. Stronger weapons, new technology, that helps. Uh, but this war uh, and invasions leads to a stoppage of trade and a loss of skills, including writing, craft making, uh, farming decreases. And as farming decreases, that means less food, and less food means our population decreases as well. 
Continuing on here, Dark Ages. Getting into the Greek Dark Ages, this is a time period of 1200 to 800 BCE. There's that loss of literacy. Almost always what we define in terms of a Dark Age in a civilization uh, is this loss of literacy. We move away from having large cities back to a village life sort of situation. And in a village life situation we have is they're constantly fighting amongst each other. And there's also then a lack of unity because of our geography, which is, will lead to the development of several city-states later on. Okay, We have simple governments for these villages, and because there's frequent warfare going on, as you see there in, number C, in letter C, okay, we have very primitive monarchs, and that monarch tends to be the guy who can best protect us in time of war or help us take over our neighbors, so literally the best fighter, because of the frequent warfare, becomes our chief or our simple primitive monarch. Okay, again, let's keep in mind our geography here, okay, and how it affects things. Oops, what did I here? Uh, okay, again, because of the geography, city-states develop instead of a single unified empire. This is a very rugged uh, landscape, mountainous. Uh, we become a seafaring culture, thousands upon thousands of miles of uh, coastline there. And this landscape leads to this idea of isolation or the city-states as opposed to consolidation into a single unified empire. Continuing with our Dark Ages, uh, there is some social evolution in the late Dark Ages. Okay, We're going to see some population increases as things sort of settle down and we start fighting so much amongst each other. Um, population will increase because food production goes up and people aren't being killed in warfare. We're going to see an evolution of folks who are land rich versus folks, folks who are land poor, which is going to lead to an idea of citizenship a little bit later on. Okay, We're going to see the emergence of the aristocracy. These are the land rich, and because they're wealthier, they consider themselves, as I said, to be better than the rest of the people. Uh, and part of that is because they have horses. They are the cavalry in battle, and being the cavalry, they are very important in battle. And as such, they think they have more rights. Plus, they get more land. Okay. Tension grows, however, and we'll talk about why, what causes that growth of tension uh, in society. Okay. Conquest amongst uh, various city states is unlikely because we're now going to be evenly matched. Okay. Revolution is unlikely because the aristocracy so controls things that we can't get together organized enough to take them over. Okay. So we turn to colonization. Okay. Colonization is a way, uh, the answer that's most often taken, but it doesn't always solve our problems. Okay. Now, in our Dark Ages, our Ionians had reintroduced uh, Greek culture by about 750 BC. Uh, the bards, these are singing storytellers that kept traditions alive. It's a lyric age, excuse me, it's a, the Dark Ages, there's no writing, but by these singing storytellers who keep the uh, uh, traditions and stories to music to help them remember them, they keep the, the traditions alive. Okay. The blind poet Homer is said to have lived in his time, and as your book said, he is uh, accredited with uh, composing the Iliad and the Odyssey, and that's because we're not actually sure if he's the guy, we'll talk about that in just one second here. Okay, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, this is a quest to save Helen of Troy and the journey back after that battle. Okay, Homer, again, this is uh, a blind poet. No one's actually quite sure who this guy actually is, if he actually existed, and if he did exist, if he existed during the Dark Ages. Okay, his stories have a slight memories of the Mycenaean past. Okay, they are, however, a strong reflection of Dark Age and Dark Age society in terms of the levels of society, those has and have nots, the aristocrats versus the average person, uh, the land rich versus the land poor. Okay, and again, this is literature from an illiterate age. This is oral poetry. Okay, the rhyme and the meter make the stories, you know, about history and creation easier to remember. Think about that. If you have to remember a poem, you have a hard time. Set it to music, make it a song, you guys can remember it very easily. Okay. Uh, again, um, the stories where people say that he actually, Homer did actually exist, his position in Greek life, uh, when did he actually live, we're not really sure, as they said, in the Dark Ages or later and wrote about the past. We do know, however, that when he was written and his books first came out, he was not, they were not particularly well-liked, not particularly well-respected, although they've become classics now and are still around. Okay? Again, the two major works are the Iliad, the story of the Trojan War, 
uh, and Helen of Troy who was kidnapped. This is a 54-day period. And the Odyssey, the story of Odysseus and his return from the Trojan War, which takes him 10 years. I'm not so sure he actually wanted to get back. Okay, he was captured several times. Okay, so we're coming out of that Dark Age time period. Uh, we've reintroduced culture, and with uh, culture and farming increases, population increases. And these many city-states uh, begin to develop as opposed to being simple villages. Our excess population is sent to live in overseas colonies. The colonies send back food to the main city-state, okay, but we've also lowered our population by sending them off to be in the colonies. And these colonies grow grain, and uh, the homelands can grow export crops like olives and grapes. Uh, other people move to the city center to learn a craft or a trade and become some kind of skilled craftsman. Uh, again, it's that idea of division of labor, the reintroduction of culture and society for the Greeks. Okay. But times are changing now, 800 to 500 BCE. Uh, the Lyric Age, again, this is colonization. Uh, one of those things is... Uh, let me just come all the way down here on this one. Okay. It's over here in Ionia, okay, Asia Minor, or today modern-day Turkey. Uh, unfortunately for the Greeks, the city-states get this idea of becoming independent, something we as Americans and former colonies of England know a lot about. Okay. It relieves but doesn't end our political crisis back home in terms of our population of the haves versus have-nots. It does, however, spread Greek people and knowledge throughout the Mediterranean, not just Ionia, down to North Africa, uh, into parts of the Middle East, into Italy, all the way over to France and even Spain, all have colonies of the Greeks. Okay? This promotes trade and it brings Greeks into contact with older civilizations. Uh, including the Persians, and we're going to see that's going to be a problem because the Persians don't like them coming over here and encroaching on what they see as their empire. Okay, here's where a big change in society comes about. Okay, these influences of these older civilizations virtually change every aspect of Greek, Greek, Greek life. We're going to see, first of all, the rise of tyrants, these guys who come to power uh, during a time of turmoil and, and rule. Okay. We're going to see an influence uh, and the foreign uh, influence that undermines the aristocrats. Uh, we're going to see the development of a merchant class. We're going to find merchants who are trading in these colonies and other places around the Mediterranean. They become wealthy. How come that guy who's an aristocrat is better than me just because he had some land? I've now got more money than him. But a big important thing is this thing right here. This is the hoplite phalanx. Look at this guy. It's, it's a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder wall of shields and armor and these big, huge, up to 20-foot-long spears. Nothing I want to charge into. Okay? The big thing about this is uh, the revolution leads to tyrants coming in to uh, deal with these city-states that are fighting each other early on. Um, it's a sort of piecemeal process. It doesn't happen Everywhere all over the city-states of Greece, it might happen here, and then, you know, several years later in some other city-state. It's a chaotic time period. Remember, when you're fighting like this and having chaos, that's bad for trade, bad for civilization in general. Moving along, the tyrants become replaced by tobocracies. We're going to define that as citizenship based on land ownership. So even if you have a lot of land, you've got more uh, rights as a citizen, a little bit of land to have any kind of citizenship. Okay. That will change a little bit later, but it's the conclusion, it's, this is a time period, this lyric age, of tremendous change. And ideas of individualism will develop, and part of that is because as the hoplite phalanx comes along, and those guys standing shoulder to shoulder fighting, what happens is the cavalry is less important. And so those guys say, we want rights, and so we got to define how we define what is a citizen. Okay. A lot of you guys ask about the Greek gods here, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in class. But these great gods had an area of strength, but they often had human characteristics and human failings. Mr. Pulley, they did whatever they wanted to do. They didn't seem very like good role models at all. Well, they're not role models, okay? This is mythology, but we got to realize we call it a myth. This is what most of them actually believed, okay? Because the gods have explained how life came to be the way it is, and how we came to be the way we are. Why are we flawed? Just look at our gods. They're terrible. Okay, here we go. Um, the development of the city-states, the polis, okay? The polis, again, this is this uh, city-state, the city, often on a hill, which is the Acropolis, and the surrounding fields, the fields, because that's what's going to feed us. Uh, realize that not everyone lives inside the wall city, 
but in case of attack, we all come in to the city. Okay. From that word polis, we get things like police and politics that we use in modern society. And the Acropolis, this is the uh, fortified part of the polis on top of that hill. Again, this is the wall you have to kind of charge up to. Look how steep that is. Guys up there throwing things at you as you're trying to attack. Not a good situation to have to be in if I'm trying to attack that. That's the idea. Okay. There's also up uh, in this area, as you get up there, the Agora or the marketplace of the polis. Uh, this is where um, meetings are held there as opposed, to not, as opposed to simply being a market where things are sold or, and or traded. Still going, on, <clears throat> still going on with the development of the city-states. Uh, again, we're talking about this colony, and we're defining that as an area, okay, and another part of the Mediterranean, but it is tied to the polis. Uh, we settle someplace else, but we're still part of that original polis or city-state. Okay. Again, they sent back grains. It's a way for Polis to deal with increases in population following the end of the Dark Ages and, and the rise of population and the subsequent lack of food for everybody. Okay. But you got to realize, whenever we increase food production, okay, we're going to also increase our population. Okay. Our colonies uh, trade in contact with other civilizations, and they adopt the idea of coins from the Lydians, alphabet from the Phoenicians, uh, this is that idea of cultural diffusion, adopting ideas from other places, okay? Our warrior kings began to lose power to the wealthy landowners. That's that uh, aristocrats, the aristocracy develops. Um, they provided the cavalry, but as we said, with that hoplite, fa hoplite phalanx and changes from there, that's going to be a change. And here they are again. Look at this massive situation. They can also lift those back up and turn if they needed to, not instantaneously, but fast enough for any kind of attack. Okay. Again, this allows our farmers, our foot soldiers, to become more important, so they demand more rights. And middle-class merchants who did extremely well but didn't necessarily have land wanted more rights as well. Okay. This unrest was what led to that development of one man seizing power to settle things down so trade gets restored, and we call that a tyrant. Okay. Some rule unjustly, and that's where we get our current word, tyranny, and now we refer to someone who rules unjustly as being a tyrant, they use that word to define a guy who sees power to bring order, which actually doesn't sound very unjust. Okay, the tyrants rule to about 500 BCE. Most city-states become an oligarchy where a few wealthy people hold power or a democracy where power lies in the hands of all citizens. Okay, uh, oligarchies, um, places like Sparta, which will actually slide back to being a monarchy with a dual monarch, uh, or democracy, the prime example of that being Athens. Okay, citizens took part uh, in the government. Okay, land ownership required. Again, that rule will change a little bit later on. Okay, voting is usually done in the Agora. Uh, that's up in that area. You see uh, below that broken piece of pottery, uh, that sort of open place. They're climbing up there to do that. Uh, names were scratched on a piece of pottery, an ostracon, uh, and this is the person who chose. In this case, what we're voting on is you guys get in, in Athens anyway, for uh, serving in the government by a lottery system. Every person in society was expected to be able to serve, okay? every citizen. And if you thought you were doing, we thought you were doing badly, we could vote you out or ostracize you. Okay, the ostracon becomes to ostracize. Okay, ostracization. That's what we're talking about. Okay, that's where we're going to stop. I'm going to start with the second video a little bit later on, the tale of two Greek cities as opposed to Dickens, the tale of two other cities. Ask your English teacher. Okay. At any rate, the two cities we're going to look at, we've talked about a little bit already in class. That's going to be Athens and Sparta. We'll see you then.